Last couple of uh, weeks, we have uh, been spending studying the enormity of God, understanding, trying to understand, can't say understanding because we can't really comprehend God, trying to understand God in the context of time. Am I right? Uh, last week I uh, noted that I spent too much time doing a summary of the previous week, and so our sermon ended up being a bit longer. And today's study actually is um, very sensitive and a little bit difficult, it requires actually three studies, but I'm going to try and pack three into one today and uh, see if we can't make sense out of it. However, we're going to talk about not so much God in time, but God in space. God in space and in nature. I want to read Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. This is just setting the foundation for our study today. And this has been part of the passages that we have been using in the last couple of weeks. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle in the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light. We're going to discuss two portions of this passage very specifically today. One, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. Second portion, surely the dark, if I say that surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you and the night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. I want to read Jeremiah 23 verses 23 and 24. This is also a passage we've read the last two weeks, but I want to read it again. I have been working diligently since I got here this morning to try and cut down the sermon because I had it too long and I thought, man, this is going to be too long. So I've been rewriting portions of it to make sure that I can cut it down. So we'll summarize it, but we do have to repeat a little bit for context. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. Am I only a God nearby, declares the God, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them? Do not I fill heaven and the earth, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. I want you to turn with me to, if you will, Romans. My Bible is still sticking because it's brand new. Before we go to Romans, I want to go to Jeremiah. Since we're in Jeremiah, I want to talk to you about a certain principle of God. Jeremiah 33. We'll come back to this later, but while we're here, I want to review it with you. Basic principle of God. This is what the Lord says. If I have not made my covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Then if I have not made my covenant with the day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, what does that mean? That God has established the laws of heaven 
and the laws of earth. What are the laws of heaven and earth? The laws of heaven and earth are nature, are science. I wasn't the brightest uh, student in school. Some classes I did better than others. But the classes that I was really, really afraid of were the sciences. And all the science students always made fun of us who were uh, the arts students. They thought that they were really smart and we art students were not so bright, which is probably true. And uh, so I left all of my science electives. We were talking about electives earlier. I left all my science electives till the very end. Don't laugh, Vinoy. <laughs> Chemistry, biology, physics, I left it all. Even math, I left it till the very end. I was so scared. But then when I had to take it, I went to visit Dr. Lee. I said, Dr. Lee, I, I, I don't know about science. I was pretty mediocre in high school. And so I've been afraid. And now it's like, you know, I've got to take it. So he spent some time with me. He said, listen, here's what you do. Before every class, you make sure you read every chapter. And you understand everything. And that way, when the lecture takes place, you'll understand what the lecture is. And you can ask intelligent questions. And I really listened to him. And I, I worked so hard. And you know what? I didn't get A's in all my theology classes, but I got A's in all my science classes. And I began to enjoy science. And today we're going to study a little bit of science. Read with me Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Those of you that have been around in our Bible studies on Friday evenings and Saturdays, we've studied this. Romans 1, 20. For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, what? Invisible. His invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. excuse. What does it mean? What does it say? The invisible God nature. is in nature. And the science of this invisible God is there for us to investigate and for us to look at and for us to study. So in nature, we can see God. When God made man, God gave dominion to man over what? Over? His creation. What does it mean to have dominion over creation? Does it just mean to make sure you water the plants? You feed the animals, make sure you cut the hedges. Is that what it means? Means to observe and learn from it and tame it and grow from it. There are laws of nature. There are laws of science that God, we just read Jeremiah 33, am I right? God said, my covenant. If I don't have my covenant, if I don't have my laws in nature, then my covenant with Abraham is no good. God is very sure of that. And he challenges us for that. And for that reason, today we're going to delve into physics. To understand God and space. More specifically, God we cannot say God in space, because if we say God in space, then we can find God within the known space. So we have to say God and space. In order to understand the enormity of God, we have to understand where we live in relation to the rest of the universe. What is the source of life as we know it on this earth? The... Great, big, bright, hot, shiny what? Sun. Right? Why? Do you know why? Because it is the light from the sun that makes waves and gives waves to atoms and the particles that create life, that sustain life. We'll get into that a little bit more in just a little while. Now, how far is the sun? From this earth. Come on, all the smart people. How far is it? No, really far is not the right answer. It's a good answer. 
93 million miles. 93 million miles. And do you know how long it takes for light to travel from the sun to this earth? How long does it take? How many minutes? Here's a, this is sign language. What is that? What is that in sign language? Eight. It takes eight minutes, very close. Eight minutes. It takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to here. Is that pretty fast? Light travels awfully fast. Awfully fast. And do you know how many, do you know what the name of our galaxy is? Anybody? Come on, you know this. The what? Milky something. Milky Way. Milky Way. Not chocolate Milky Way. It's the Milky Way. And how many galaxies are there in the universe? Have we counted them? Nobody knows. Nobody can count them. Do you know how? See, now notice how fast light travels. 93 million miles in eight minutes. That's as, fa that's as fast as Jubin drives. 93 million miles in eight minutes. Do you know how long it would take light to travel through just our galaxy? Just the Milky Way. Any guess? How many light years? It would take, uh, it's a hundred thousand. It's hundred thousand light years is the distance for just our Milky Way. Hundred, hundred thousand years to light, for light to travel from one side to the other. When we talk about God being present everywhere, how enormous is that? How big is that? Scientists have a pretty good idea as to how big the universe is. They don't know exactly, but so far, scientists have been able to measure the universe and they know that it is big enough it is big enough, pay close attention, pay really close attention. Just our universe that we know is so big that it would take light, light. It would take light at this speed, we know the speed. At the light of speed, it would take 150 billion years. Can you imagine that? One 150 billion years for light to travel at its speed from one end of the known universe to the other and from top to bottom. That's not possible to imagine because we don't think in terms of billions. Never. We don't, I don't think we have anything of billions except maybe cells in our bodies. We don't have a concept of billions. 150 billion years for light to travel. And that's the known universe. Then there's the unknown universe. God is bigger than that universe. He is not contained in that universe. He's outside of that. We're told that everything that exists, everything that exists, exists in the palm of his hand. That is God. That is God. To understand his godhood, to understand his omnipotence, uh, sorry, um, uh, omnipresence, we also have to understand the various dimensions in which we live, and the dimensions in which God lives. Now, we live in a world that is a three-dimensional world. Am I right? We live in a three-dimensional world. Now, what is a three-dimensional world? Anybody? Let's start with one dimension. What is a single-dimensional world? 
What is one dimension? One dimension is just a line. That's it, just a line. One line, that's it. One line. Now, one line, how many ways can that line be changed? Can it be made? It's just one line. The only way that line can be changed is its length. This way and this way. That's one dimension. Then we have a two-dimensional flat where it can be changed this way and this way. Two ways, that's it. That's a two-dimensional world. We then have a three-dimensional world. And what is a three-dimensional world? Here. This can be moved out that way. And it can be out this way. And it can be out this way. Three different ways. All the world that we know, everything that we have, everything that we see, is three-dimensional. We live in a three... That is, the, that is a maximum dimension in which we can live. Whether it's our clothes, whether it's our, 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 our glasses, whether it's our... Whatever. It's a three-dimensional world. We can see things, we can feel things. So, the one dimension, two dimension, three dimensional, they're all included in that. The one dimension is included in the three-dimensional world. God, there is a, another dimension that we don't see. In order for us to be part of this dimension, in order for us to understand this dimension, we need something. What do we need in order to see it? We need light, right? And how does light work? Light works in waves. Just as sound works in waves. How does sound work? Something has to move and make a sound. So I've got my vocal cords in here moving. I can feel it. I can, I can actually feel the vibration of the vocal cords. And the sound comes out. When the sound comes out, it reaches something else. It reaches this, and it bounces off of here. It reaches that, bounces off of there. When we were building studios for television or for radio or for concert halls, we put dampers, they're called dampers, to dampen the sound. So the sound will get absorbed by some material in order to reduce the reverberations. Now, how do you hear me? You hear me because in your ear, there's eardrums. Am I right? When the sound leaves my mouth, it goes through this space and it reaches your ear and vibrates your ear. And depending on what the wavelength of that sound is, it could be high pitched, it could be low pitched. Your eardrum will respond to it depending on my pitch and my volume. And your eardrum will become a receiver of that sound as it goes from here to there. And that is moving in what? It is moving in waves. When it moves in those waves, that is what causes you to be able to hear. We cannot see those waves, but we can hear those waves. We also have light waves. Light waves, how do they work? Well, there's light here, and the light is coming in. It's coming in from the light bulbs, it's coming in from the windows. And through that, the light is reflecting off of your things and what you are wearing and where we are sitting. So light is reflecting off of this. So our eyes are now the receivers of the waves that are coming from where? From the different places. I can see that this is black. I can see that you're wearing kind of a rusty color. What color is that? Golden color? And you're wearing a blue shirt. 
Now, interestingly enough, every color that we see in our eyes is actually a different wavelength. A darker blue has a shorter wavelength than a gold would have. So my eyes are receiving this information by different sizes of waves. And so the entire world exists as a result of waves. How is that? How is that? Everything. Oh, before I go into that, I want to talk to you about dimensions. We're talking about the dimensions. So these dimensions that we were talking about, first, second, and third dimension, there is what is commonly called a fourth dimension, which is invisible. In this three-dimensional, we can see these things. There are lights and so on. And through the light, we can see the projection. There is a fourth dimension, which we do not have the capacity to see. Well, our eyes are not made. Our eyes don't have the receptors for the fourth dimension. This is what scientists call the invisible dimension. Believers call it the spiritual dimension. Now, there are those who teach that it is in the fourth dimension that spiritual beings reside, both good angels and bad angels, and the powers of God, and the powers of Lucifer. All the spiritual things reside in the fourth. But what's interesting is scientists cannot ex yet explain, but they know of up to 11 different dimensions. 11 unexplained dimensions that we don't understand. And there are other scientists who are saying that it's up to 14 different dimensions. And we live and exist and try to understand God when we live in a three-dimensional world. God cannot be contained either in space or in dimensions because God is innumerably dimensional, let's call it. There is no limit to how many dimensions God would be in. Each dimension that is added, when we add from what, go from one dimension to second dimension, there's a new freedom that comes with the second dimension. Then we go from second to third dimension, there's added freedoms. Am I right? You can do more. You can do all kinds of things. And the new freedom, by the way, is not a theological term. So when I say new freedoms, this is a scientific term. Scientists call it new freedoms. Therefore, when you go to the fourth dimension, there are other additional freedoms that we don't have. And we as humans don't have. And then we go to the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh dimension. And I don't know what kind of freedoms would be available in those dimensions. No idea. We we're talking about the waves, gonna go back to the waves for a little while. The sound waves exist in what we call the physical world. Physical world. Physical is that we can touch and see and feel. And then we can see the sound waves. Now what happens with sound waves? Would anybody listen to the radio still or everybody on iPhones anymore? When you turn the radio on in your car, for you young people, you, you, I'll, someday I'll explain to you what a radio used to be. Nobody knows anymore. Now, because I, I, my, my, my major was in theology, minor was in media, I had to study this radio stuff. But even though I understood the science of it, I was always so impressed by how cool it was. Now, you could have this sound invisible all around us. And you get the right receiver, and that can take and convert that sound wave into another sound that can come down to That's beautiful. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. 
Then there is a transfer of pictures. In 1996, 95, 96, I came up with this idea to uh, transmit first run movies, like movie theater movies, uh, digitally. And I began to expand that idea, got a lot of people involved, a lot of big companies involved. We did a lot of experiments with companies in California. Turned out the best technology at the time was right here in Toronto. And we were able to get use satellite, we were able to transmit digital sound, good quality digital sound into movie theaters. And the reason was there was too much piracy of movies back then. They would take movies in third world countries, uh, South America and Africa, people would make copies of the movies and the movie companies never got paid. So I think it was a great idea if we transmit the movies by satellite, the movie companies would save all the money. So they loved the idea. But we had a lot of trouble transmitting through the, the digital pictures because the, 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 the digital technology wasn't strong enough at the time. It was too much pixelation on the screens. We tested, tested, it didn't work. So for pictures to be transmitted, it takes a special kind of technology and a receiver in order to receive that. And we have a different kind of wave. We have a light wave, not a sound wave. And in order for us to see, we need light. But in the fourth dimension, there is invisible light waves that we do not see. That we cannot see. What are those? Okay. Do you know that there is equipment available? You all know this. Night vision goggles. Do you know what that is? Military people use that. You can see in the dark. There is no light. There is no light. But they can see in the dark. Then there's additional infrared, infrared light where they can look through goggles and look into a home and see the bodies in there and have, to have the bodies moving so they can see that there's warmth and they can see the shape of the body. And then scientists have, uh, have artificially put colors They've added colors. So one goggle may show you the body in red, another goggle, another company may show you in another color or whatever. They choose those colors. But we can see without the light. We can see without the light. And do you know how that happens? Because we have light inside of our bodies, which is actually mingling with the atoms in our body. The atoms as the atoms move, actually, actually the particles, neutron and proton, protons, as they move around the atoms, they have to have photons, light, to give them life. And so inside our body, there's atoms with neutron, protons, and there's the, the nucleus, and then there's eight, those are eight of the uh, other the, the particles moving around and these particles are actually trying to get life they're trying to get energy because without getting energy they die and where do they get the energy from there is energy within us that we do not see there is light within us that we do not see that responds to the needs of the particles and feeds the particles and do you know that in order for those particles to survive, those particles have to take that light and they have to give it back out to something else. So your atoms are collecting life and giving life to other parts of your body. And that is how we're able to live. The beauty in this science is that invisible God that people believe doesn't exist. If he didn't exist, we wouldn't be here to say that he didn't exist. If God didn't exist, we couldn't be here to say that he doesn't exist. It is because of him giving that light through the sun to the planet, 
giving that light without anything else, within us, giving that light to the atoms which make us what we are. There is a little bit of a study within this study of miracles. A little study on miracles. What is a miracle? Physics has divided its operations or study or philosophies or teachings into two basic uh, terms as far as the mechanics of it is concerned. One is called the classical mechanics. The classical mechanics. Classical mechanics means this is what uh, philosophers and scientists hundreds and thousands of years ago began to analyze the universe and the stars the earth, animals, nature, and they came up with certain principles that they purified more and more and more. And that can be explained visibly. That can be taught. You can see, you can experience, you can touch and feel. It's called classical mechanics. Then, there's that physics which cannot be seen, which cannot be heard, but it has its effects. It's called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. It's too small. And that's what we're talking about today when we talk about atoms and particles. We're talking about quantum physics. Quantum means what? Here's a hint. Small. Very small. How small is an atom, by the way? Anybody? An atom is so small you can put 10 million atoms in one millimeter. That's pretty small. That's pretty small. And scientists are able to break those down and study particles and quarks. Amazing. Now, within the classical mechanics of physics and physics, we're able to manipulate things. For example, we can take that uh, bench and we can move it. We can cut it. We can sand it and we can repaint it. Very simple principles of physics. Very simple. In quantum mechanics, you don't have the luxury of touching and feeling and moving. You cannot manipulate it. We can manipulate the three-dimensional, visible, classical mechanics. We can manipulate that world, but not the invisible. Now, there are certain laws in physics that we know that if I were to pick this up, and if it was to fall on my toe, it would hurt. That's a really basic law of physics. If I pick it up and drop it, uh, grav gravitational pull will bring it down. If I have somebody standing on that side, me standing on this side, we'd push it, but we wouldn't move it very easily in either way. The stronger person would eventually push it more that way or that way, but it wouldn't be easy. The easiest would be if they're both pushing in the same direction. That's basic physics. But when it comes to God, he knows the rules of the visible physics. He knows the rules of classic mechanics. But beyond that, God knows and understands the rules of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. If 50 years ago, Somebody said you're going to have a cell phone, that you're going to be able to talk on the cell phone around the world. People would laugh. There used to be a TV show called uh, Get Smart. And in that, this guy used to, this spy, uh, the, this agent, uh, used to have a telephone in his shoe. And he would, uh, if he got arrested or got get in trouble, he'd take off his shoe and he used to open it up and he used to use the phone. People used to laugh, ah, look at that, there's no phone like that. Now, if somebody doesn't have a phone, people laugh, eh, no, he doesn't have a phone. <laughs> the world has changed. 
Why? Because we understood the laws of physics and we manipulated the laws of physics to create a cell phone. Someday we will understand the laws of physics to such a degree that we will no longer need a little cell phone. We will have something, they already have it actually, built into our bone structure and a telephone number that you already have for life. So somebody calls you, you'll hear it right there. And when you talk, you just talk like you're talking. You don't need to carry a phone anywhere. All your bills, everything else is going to be right here. They have it already. It's already, it's, it, it already exists. Pay your bills through it. You're going to call somebody, you just say, hey, call Paul. And he'll call Paul. I'm sure somebody's going to get to you just with, think, call Paul. You better not think too much. We're calling all kinds of people. So, now, when we can manipulate these things, in medical science, we can do things today that you could not dream of doing a hundred years ago. Even 50 years ago. Now they're saying that another 20, 25 years, they're going to allow humans to live to be 125 years old. Healthy. That's manipulating of known science. As we get to know science, we begin to manipulate the laws of science to do things that would have been considered miracles many years ago. I remember seeing a movie one day about missionaries in Africa. And the missionary was trying to impress the local people that they had the gift to communicate by writing. So the man sends his wife way over there. And he writes on a piece of paper and he tells the one person, I have written this. This is, I'm telling you. So he told her, uh, maybe less for argument's sake, tell, uh, dear wife, come over here. Just for argument's sake. So tell my wife to come over here. He writes it, gives it to the native person. He goes over there and he gives it to the wife. And he says, what does it say? He says, oh. He says, dear wife, come over here. And he got so scared. He thought it was witchcraft. He thought it was witchcraft. And they began to listen to the guy. Because he had such power to communicate. There is so much in science and the principles of physics that we don't understand. That God creates. And even though in Jeremiah 33, 25, God says, He lives within the laws of nature, which He put in place, the covenant of nature. God doesn't take miracles lightly. He doesn't make miracles every day. Because if it happened every day, it wouldn't be a miracle anymore. But He has the ability to manipulate because He has the knowledge of the physics of science that He put in place. Just as we can manipulate science, God can also take those rules within the confines of his own rules because God will not break a rule. And that's how he creates miracles. Now what does all that have to do with us? What does all that have to do with us? Within us, what are we made of? We're made of atoms. I didn't say Adam, like A-D-A-M. We're, we're from Adam, yeah. But atoms. We're made of atoms. Atoms are made of particles. And particles survive with the movement of the waves that are created. And everything in the world creates waves or is part of that waves. There's nothing that is not affected by or part of that waves. There are waves inside us. And that creates energy and life. In Genesis, the Bible tells us, in the beginning was the Word. And Jesus, and God, when God created the world, he, what did He say? There was darkness upon the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God did what? The Spirit of God moved. The word that's used in the Greek over there actually translates to hover or flutter. Hover or flutter. When a bird flutters, what happens? The wings. 
It makes waves. It makes waves. It makes waves. The Spirit of God fluttered. The Spirit of God is humongous. And as that Spirit moved, God said, let there be light. What was the first thing he made? Light. The Bible tells us the morning and the evening were the first day. This is physics now. Without the waves, there could be no light. Without the light, there could be no life. Because it was light responding to the particles that made the atoms out of which God made everything else. That's the bigger picture. In the smaller picture, we have a little baby. That little baby has inside him or her atoms that are moving around invisibly and, being, and, and, and having an interaction with light. And that light is in our bodies. It is the light of God. Turn with me to Luke 11. Luke 11. Thirty-six. Luke eleven, thirty-six. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light, and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light. On you. Our bodies, when we accept God and have Him in our life, by my friends, God is in us. By the way, I'm not preaching pantheism. There are those who there are those who teach that God is in everything. This is not what we're talking about. Not at all. Also, 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 verse 22 He anointed us set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come I have other text, but we're not going to review them just now, but what I would like you to review is our text of today. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And there, verses 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. When we talk about God when we talk about God being in us and God changing us, this is what we're talking about. Matthew 28. Come to me, all who are, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just as the radio, radio has in it instruments that take the sound and converts it. Right now we're sitting here, I almost brought a little transistor radio with me. I used to carry it to be able to listen to the Toronto Blue Jays all the time. If I was to turn it on, we could hear the radio on it. But without it, can we hear the radio? You have your telephones. Without the telephone, can we see the pictures of YouTube on it? No. And yet the pictures of YouTube are hovering around here, are they not? All the videos of YouTube are here. They're hovering around us. But it's no good to us unless we have a receiver in that telephone. Doesn't work.
within us. In order for us to be able to communicate with the spiritual. This is the crux of the sermon today. This is the message of the sermon. In order for me to be able to live the spiritual life that God wants, no matter how hard I try, if I don't have the receiver in me, I cannot accept that spirit of God. Amen. I cannot. And it is for that reason that Jesus says, I will give you another comforter. He breathes on the disciples, the Holy Spirit. And when that Holy Spirit becomes part of that life, by your choice, that new freedom we were talking about, in the three dimensional, we, in the second dimensional, we get a new freedom. In the third dimensional, we get a new freedom. In the fourth spiritual dimension, we get a new freedom to be able to say, yes, Jesus Christ, and accept God that His Spirit may come into our hearts. That through that reception, our lives begin to change. Then just like the radio now can put those songs on you couldn't sing before. We begin to do things we couldn't do before. It's not by our own effort. That's why the Bible says that whatever you do by your own effort is worth nothing. Zero. It's artificial. It's fake. It's like playing a CD in a car and playing it over and over and over again. Can you get the same effect from a CD or from one of those uh, I, 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 iPod? The pod? Do people still use iPods? Or something like that? You keep playing the same music. If you have music downloaded on your phone, you're limited to the music that you, that's downloaded. That's it. As a human, you can try and do good. You can try and live a good life, but you're limited to what you can do. It is only to the power of God when Jesus is accepted into our lives and He becomes the transformer, the converter, that our lives change. And we get new freedoms in the fourth dimension that we never had in the third dimension. And when we become in harmony with God, when we become in harmony with God, with Jesus in our lives, it becomes easier to live the way He wants us to live, rather than fighting. That's why Jesus says, let me come. He says, I will give you rest. How? He will take away all that difficulty in trying to live a good life. Because when He comes into our hearts, when He comes into our lives, we synchronize with Him. We become one with Him. We no longer go against Him. When we go together, it's much easier. Rather than pushing on one side, pushing from the other side. We both push in the same direction. And the power of God transforms us. I um, wanted to show you an experiment. And I didn't bring anything, but I'm going to just give you a little bit of a, an idea. This is my pendulum. Now, like a swing, it's static. We cannot measure the amount of energy that it takes for me to move it. If I put a little bit of energy, it moves a little bit. If I give it more energy, it moves further. Now, if I move it that way, it comes back. Now, if I move it while it's, while it's going in that direction, while this is moving in this direction, if I move it, it takes a lot more energy for it to go back. But if I let it go that way, come up here, and then I push it, it doesn't take much energy while it's already going in that direction. Do you get it? If I push it, when it's pushing against me, it takes more energy. If I push it while it's already going in that direction, it takes much less energy. That's the way it is with us. When God becomes part of our lives and we are trying to live a life that we think is righteous, it's difficult. It's hard. But when we go in the same direction from the transformation in our hearts, I'm going to ask Vivid to put up a little uh, experiment here. Do you know what, um, what a metronome is, anybody? A metronome 
is uh, you know what a metronome is. A metronome keeps the rhythm, keeps a beat. Click, 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 click. And it is made so it keeps the timing exact. It is not supposed to change, am I right? The metronome is supposed to keep the musician on the beat. On the beat. But if you take several metronomes and you put them all on different, different speeds, or put them on at, the, at, at a different time, and you put them on a platform that is flexible, they work it out that soon they all begin to go at the same speed. Can you turn this on for me, please? Now watch this. Do we have a sound on this? See, they're all going in different directions, different times. Now watch. What happened? What happened? They all synchronized. Thank you. How did they synchronize? Space. They were flexible in the space to be able to allow change in their condition. In order for us to be synchronized with God and with one another, we have to have the ability to study God's word and be flexible to understand it Amen. and accept it. And then through this word of God, we can be in harmony with God and with one another. This is God in quantum physics. In the minutest way, God is there. In your life, in my life, God is there to transform us physically in things that we don't see. But it is He who changes us. Amen. Of ourselves, we cannot do anything. We can do no good thing. We're selfish, nasty human beings. Our efforts mean nothing. The only effort that we can have is to open our hearts to God and say, God, I need help. It's my prayer that as we study God's nature, we see in it the presence of God. Ever since I said here at um, Monday in Communion that in order for us to eat, something has to die. Every time I eat, pretty much every time I eat, I feel bad. Something's died for me. And you know, Jesus died for us that we don't have to die. All we have to do is accept Jesus Christ, invite him into our hearts. And we need to understand the nature of God and how intimately he knows us so that we can experience that close relationship with him that he desires. He is in us and he will change us. All we need to do is give our lives to him. God bless you.